Father, hear their words that I would teach the scriptures correctly, rightly dividing them. And I pray that you would, in a busy, noisy, crowded, cluttered world, that you would calm our spirits, soften our hearts, that we would be receptive to the truth that would take root and slowly but eventually transform us. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We're going to look at John chapter 15 today. So if you have your Bibles, turn there to John 15. I'm going to say to you at the offset, apart from you coming to faith in Jesus Christ, I believe that John 15 is the most important passage for a believer in all of Scripture. The truths laid out in this chapter um, are deep, um, insightful, scary, essential, and if you get it, it will transform you, and if you don't get it, you will limp through your Christian life. I want you to watch, uh, as we've gone through John, a clip that is of the scriptures, John 15, 1 through 15. Watch it, and then we'll study it together. I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me. And I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. Those who do not remain in me are thrown out like a branch and dry up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire, for they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish you shall have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. I love you, just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them, and you are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so, the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This, then, is what I command you. The last words, last teachings of anyone who's about to die are always most important. I don't know if you've had the chance to go to a hospital and sit with a friend who is hours away from dying, and I can tell you this, that they won't be talking about their cars, their clothes, their iPhone. They will be talking about that which is closest, dearest to them. Jesus, in John 14, has just left the upper room. And having left the upper room, he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a simple process. It's a walk. And as he's walking, he does what he always does, a teaching. That's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus didn't teach people always in a classroom setting. He used life to teach them. 
And so he's walking along either through a vineyard or a, along a wall with a grapevine growing. And being the master teacher, he stops and he teaches them from the vine. So it becomes really the last teaching of Jesus. I mean, from this point on, he's going to get arrested and crucified. So this is his last moment, which is obviously, I think, the most important thing that he could teach his disciples and the most important thing he could teach us. And so he gets them to focus. And he talks to them. And in these 11 verses... Jesus uses the word abide 11 times. Abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. And he drives that theme because what he's going to teach us is this simple truth. That unless you and I are abiding in him, we're the branch, he's the vine. Unless we abide in him, we can do nothing. We will do nothing significant. That's his teaching. Miss it, and you miss it all. It is what is most important to him. First things first. And the first thing first in any given day is that you know that you're connected, that you remain, that you abide, that you're attached to Jesus. That is the most important thing for you. It's more important than the husband you are. It's more important than the employee you are. It's more important than the church member you are. What is most important in your life, first things first, is that you're connected to Jesus. That's, that's what he is teaching here in John 15. There's a book called The Tyranny of the Urgent. It's a, it's a good book. You should read it sometime. It's basically this thesis. That it's the urgent that screams at us every day. It's the tyranny of the urgent. There's always something urgent in our life that's screaming for our attention. And the urgent isn't always what's most important. It's the urgent that says, pay your bills. It's the urgent that says, get to work on time. It's the urgent that says, and, they, and it continues to scream, speak, yell at us throughout each day. And we live in the tyranny of the urgent when what we should be most concerned about is that which is important. And the urgent becomes superior to the important because it's the important that says, mostly in whispers, a child who says to his parent, can we go play catch in the driveway? A wife who whispers, I need a hug. Sometimes that which is most important whispers while that which is most urgent screams and we tend to go to that which is screaming. And Jesus wants us to remember first things first. In 1973, an Eastern Airline L-1011, the largest passenger planes at that time, was flying into Miami's International Airport. Some two miles away, the co-pilot pushed the button for the landing gear to drop. And in the cockpit, when the landing gear locks, a light comes on, and he noticed the light didn't come on. And so he told the pilot that he didn't know if, in fact, the landing gear had dropped or not. And so the pilot aborted the, the landing, circled out over the Everglades, and at 2,000 feet got permission to circle while the pilot and the co-pilot in this massive plane tried to determine if, in fact, the landing gear had gone down. And in the cockpit, they opened up a little hatch, and the co-pilot climbed down to get a visual image of the landing gear to determine, because he could manually drop it if, if, it, if in fact it had not dropped. And the pilot put the plane in autopilot and got out of his chair to go look to help the co-pilot and unbeknownst to him, knocked the plane out of autopilot. And this plane, L-1011, circling the Everglades, no lights, the darkness of that Everglades, began to start at 2,000 feet and ever so slowly dropped 100 feet incrementally, but so slowly that it would regain its balance and then dropped another 100 feet. 
and then another 100 feet. And while the co-pilot and the pilot were trying to determine if the landing gear was down, the plane was ever so slowly descending until it crashed into the Everglades and killed 101 people. The National Transportation Board went in. They wanted to know why this elegant, brand new L-1011 had crashed, and they discovered that, in fact, the landing gear had been down. And what had caused their distraction was a 99-cent light bulb that had burned out. A pilot and a co-pilot, in the midst of the urgent, forgot what was most important, and what was most important was flying the airplane, and they missed it. Same thing is true for believers. We can get so involved in church, so active in everything else, trying to be the best dad, trying to be the best grandparents, trying to be the best neighbor, trying to be the best employee, the best employer, the best friend, that we forget that what is most important is whether or not we're connected to the vine, to Jesus. I don't know if you remember, but in the movie... City Slickers, that came out a while back. Story of three buddies who every year go on a vacation. They all go on this vacation to get away from their wives. But on this one particular summer, they go on a vacation because all three men are in a midlife crisis. They're, they are afraid of death. They're com becoming old. And so they go and go on this cattle drive with an old, old cowboy named Curly who creates havoc for these city slickers in the midst of driving cattle from one location to another. And halfway through the story, Curly looks at them and he says, let me tell you the secret of life. Right there. And Billy Crystal, one of the characters, says, what's the secret of life, a finger? <laughs> and Curly says, no, not a finger. One thing. One thing. Get this one thing right and everything else falls into place. Billy Crystal says, okay, what's the one thing? And Curly looks at him and says, you're going to have to figure out that one thing. <laughs> Here's the good news for us. Jesus tells us what the one thing is. There's one thing that's more important than everything else, and that one thing more than anything else is that you abide, you stay connected to, you remain in the vine, Jesus, because it is in that vital relationship that you will produce fruitfulness. So Jesus is walking with his disciples. I think they come across a, a wall filled with grape vines, and he says to the guys, look at here it is. I'm the vine, you are the branches. The branches don't bear fruit. The vine does. The branches are just a means to it. They got that. They got that if they're a branch, that a branch doesn't produce the fruit, it's the vine. It's the branch who simply brings the nutrients to the grapes. And he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. They understood that clearly. Let me give you an analogy that may help you a little more. It's as if I took all of you and we walked out these doors, this door right here, and we walked over to the gas station. Valero, right? And that are right next door. And we walk through the gas station by the pumps, and I say to you, stop, no, no, no. Okay, everybody, watch this. Listen. Jesus is the pump. You're the nozzle. Take the nozzle away from the pump and it produces no gas. The gas isn't in the nozzle. It's just a vehicle for the gas to leave the pump to get to the car. You're the nozzle. Jesus is the gas pump. Uh, the nozzle apart from the gas pump produces nothing. And then I look at you and say, get it? And you go, yes, go ahead, do it. You're the nozzle. That's all you are, the nozzle. He's the pump. Let me give you to another analogy that might help. If I said, Jesus is the electricity, the current, the plug, you're the light bulb. And if I were to take the light bulb out, it would not produce any light. I, 
We could hold it. It would be of no value. It is just there. It needs to be screwed in, attached to, connected to the source of electricity. And when it's connected, it can produce light. Your light bulbs. Jesus is electricity. Now, all I can see are those lights, little circles. Now, you've all left the room. It's black, and I see a thousand drops. So Jesus is going to teach us three things in John 15. I want to, we could spend weeks on this. We're going to spend one morning, I'm going to hit three ideas. No, there's much more here. Here are the three truths that I want you to just glance at as we look at it this morning. In verse 1, there's a person of Jesus. In verses 2 through 4, there's the pruning of the Father. The person of Jesus, verse 1, the pruning of the Father, verses 2 through 4, and the produce, not product, the produce of the believer in verses 5 through 14. That's what Jesus is going to have us look at today. We are going to look at three elements. Jesus, the Father, and us, or the person, the pruning, and the produce of it. So let's go there. John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus doesn't say, I'm the vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And what he's referencing is this, that he is the true vine as opposed to the false vine. And so the question is, what's the false vine? The false vine is the nation of Israel. These guys thought the way to get into the kingdom of God is to be a Jew, to be a part of the nation of Israel. And all the way through the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as a vine. Jeremiah, it's a vine. Psalms, it's a vine. These men knew that when Jesus said, I am the true vine, he was contrasting himself to the nation of Israel. Why is that important? Because what Jesus would say to you this morning is that he is the true vine and faith and salvation doesn't come through religion. It comes through a relationship with him. Coming to church isn't going to save you. Opening your Bible this morning isn't going to save you. Religion isn't going to save you. The law isn't going to save you. Jesus saves you. That, that's, that's what he's, I am the true vine. If you want to find life, you find it in me. And life is found in the living, not in the dead. Life is found in that which is living and not that which is material. And yet all of us have this tendency to continue to buy one more thing, thinking that new iPhone 8 is really going to produce the joy that the iPhone 7 didn't. Or if we just get that convertible, that's going to breed some life into me. Or, you know, if we just move from this neighborhood to that neighborhood, then I'm going to experience life. Or if I get the gold chain in my midlife crisis, I'm going to find life, right? We, 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 we go to that which is dead thinking it's going to produce life. It gives us an, ish, an element of life and energy for a couple of hours, and it, then it becomes something that doesn't produce much. We seek life in that which is dead, that which is material, and Jesus drives us to this element that it is life is found in the living, and in particular, life is found in him. Don't make the mistake of thinking religion will breathe life into you any more than a Jew thought that being a part of the nation of Israel would breathe life into him or her. Somebody has said this, churches grow when the pastor knows Jesus. Churches die when the believers only know the pastor. Churches grow when pastors know Jesus. Churches die when the people only know the pastor. I mean, my job is to get out of the way of Jesus. My job is to continue to move you into not a relationship with me, but a relationship with him because he is the vine, I'm not. I'm just another branch. 
Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the, dry, the vine dresser. Second role in this passage. Jesus goes from him to the father, and he says the father is the vine dresser, and as the vine dresser, the father does two things now. Catch him. He's either cutting or cultivating in this passage. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so it may produce more fruit. Jesus says, the Father, when he looks out, will cut away that which is not producing fruit. The assumption is, the premise is in all of Scripture, that a genuine believer, not a fake believer, not a fake disciple, but a true believer and a true disciple will produce fruit. And so I say to you this morning, in love, in humility, if your life isn't producing fruit, I would take some time and ask yourself, are you connected to religion? Are you connected to a relationship with Jesus? Because it's easy to make the mistake. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Just sleeping in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> and I will say to some of you, just sleeping in church doesn't make you a true believer. It, because all the way through John chapter 5, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, there are believers, 9, there are believers and disciples that are referred to as leaving Jesus. The teaching got hard. He stopped giving away the food. He closed down the buffet line. And they decided, if I'm not going to get free food, I'm out of here. If the teaching isn't going to be easy, I'm gone. If you're not here to make me happy, then I think I'll find another church or another religion. I'm gone. And Jesus, all the way through the Gospel of John, is watching people who are fake believers and fake disciples abandoning him. It happens all the time. So the first responsibility of the father as a vine dresser is if he sees those that are fake believers and fake disciples, he will cut them away. Not me, Jesus. But then Jesus goes on and says, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it will produce more fruit. Because the key of this passage is how do we create a fruitful life? How do we produce fruit out of our life? How do we produce more fruit? And Jesus says the, dry, the vine dresser, the father, will come along and even if you're producing fruit, he will prune you. The pruning process. We, we have vineyards all over this valley. They're gorgeous right now. Those vines are into branches and they extend and they're producing grapes and, and there's a beauty in that. And come this winter, the vine dresser will go out to those beautiful vines that once produced an incredible harvest and he or she will cut them back to its core. There are going to be times in your life where you think you're being very fruitful, that life should be easy now. God's doing amazing things. Ow! Ow! Because he's pruning you. Because if he doesn't prune you, all the energy will, be go, will go into producing branches and not grapes, not fruit. That's what he's talking about here. That's, that's what he wants to see. So the process is this. Why is he pruning me? Because there's a clutter, there's a complexity, there's, there's, there's just a lot of vegetation that isn't doing anything. And there are a lot of us doing a lot of things that aren't doing anything. Activity does not equal accomplishment. And we don't even know it, but in our lives we begin to accumulate. We accumulate roles, we accumulate responsibilities, we accumulate things, and before we know it, our lives are crowded and busy, so busy, so crowded, that we can't produce any fruit because we're spending all of our energy on the branches. Jesus talked about it when he talked about the soul, the heart, the soil. You remember that? He said there's four kinds of soil in life. There's the hard soil. There's the shallow soil. 
There's the crowded soil. There's the soft soil. Jesus understood our hearts, our souls, could become crowded with things to the exclusion of him so that he has no place to exist. Scripture says, Romans says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock, and if you invite me and I come in, and the image in Colossians is that Jesus enters into our heart. And there's a great book called My Heart, Christ's Home, which is described that our hearts are kind of like a home for Jesus. And we invite him into our hearts, into our home. Jesus comes in. We cleaned up the living room real well. We sit him down. We bring him some iced tea. And he doesn't want to sit down. He wants to see the rest of the house, the heart. And so he gets up and he starts walking to the library, our study. And as he walks in, all of a sudden, we're kind of embarrassed because we know the books and the magazines that we're reading. He goes over to our computer and looks up our Facebook and all of our locations and websites that we've gone to. He comes in there and we say, okay, God, Jesus, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean this up. Let the, I, I apologize. We're, I'm going to clean this up. And he leaves and he goes over to the kitchen and he looks at our appetites, our wants, our desires, what holds our attention. And he opens, this, opens up the cupboards and he sees our desires and our wants and they're not aligned to the kingdom. And we're kind of embarrassed again. And we go, no, you know, we're, I, I, okay, Jesus, I'll, I got that one too. I'll, I'll clean that one up too. Let's go back to the living room. I got that one really good. And he goes, no, let's, let's kind of look at all these things. Leaves the kitchen, he begins to walk down the hallway, and right there is one of those closets. You know, the kind that you put things in and you close the door and hope nobody goes in. And he opens it, and he sees the secrets that we're yet to be able to confess to anyone. And we, and, and we say to him, okay, Jesus, I'll, I'll clean that out too. When he comes into our hearts to indwell, he comes in not to sit, but to remodel. And the remodeling is the decluttering of our lives. That's, the, that's what the pruning is all about. Hebrews 12 says, get rid of every weight and sin that entangles you, that stops you from running fast. That, that becomes the issue here. It's an easy thing to get this wrong. Martha got it wrong. Martha and Mary. In Luke 10, you know the story. I've said it before. Martha is cleaning the kitchen. She's making dinner for Jesus. She's making dinner for Jesus. And she looks out into the living room, and her sister Mary isn't helping her. And she does all the things we all do when we want somebody to help us, but we don't say it. We give them the look. <coughs> we walk out, look at them. You've done that to your husband and wife. You go back. Martha is doing everything, and where is Mary? Mary is at the foot of Jesus listening. And Martha can stand it no longer. She is so angry with Mary not helping her in the kitchen. She says to Jesus, not Mary, but my sister doesn't help me. Tell her to help me. And Jesus' response to Martha is, Martha, Martha, you're preoccupied by the wrong things. Mary gets it. Mary knows what's most important. We're human beings, not human doers. And as you live your life doing and not being, you will eventually collapse and bankruptcy will fill your life and the clutter will cause you not to hear from him and Jesus will drive at you in this pruning process that you have too many wrong things. You're spending too much of your energy in the wrong places. Your time is spent doing that which is wrong. I taught a lot of missionaries every year, hundreds that would come in, some of which in the years would leave the faith, even as missionaries. They got, exa they got exhausted in the kitchen. It's easy. I have friends that are pastors that got exhausted in the kitchen, in the doing for Jesus rather than being with Jesus. And I wrote this parable for missionaries, but I write it to you. Carrie died last night, a surprise to us all. 
Who would have ever thought a person whose job it was to feed the poor would die of starvation? Kerry had a heart as big as his truck. He would get up early and skip breakfast to get to his first town. He would miss lunch so he could squeeze another community and he'd pass over dinner to get to one last town before nightfall. Kerry skipped the important for the urgent. Knowing Kerry like I did, he must have thought the process of feeding the poor would feed him. It didn't, it doesn't. I'm going to miss Kerry a lot, but not nearly as much as his towns will. You, I say to you, have one responsibility, one important thing that I would encourage you to do, and that is to stay connected to the vine. So let's look at the third ingredient, the person of Christ, the pruning of the Father, and the producing of the vines or believers. Verse 4, John 15. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's a big truth. If you're disconnected from Jesus, Nolan, while you're worshiping music up here, it produces nothing for him. Larry, if you're disconnected from Jesus, no matter who you're caring for, what grandchild you're caring for, it produces nothing. My life speaking, if I am disconnected from Jesus this moment, it will have no effect because Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can help all the widows you want. You can feed all the poor that you want. You can do all the things that you want. But if you, in the process of doing all of those things, have neglected that which is most important, to be abiding in the vine, connected to Jesus, then all that you do will be for naught. Now, here's the beautiful truth. Here's the simple truth I want you to hear. Big truth. Give you a moment, because I want you to catch up with me. Your only responsibility is to abide. That's it. Everything else people adds to your responsibility, you, you shake them off. You take them off your to-do list. The only thing the, the branch has to do is abide, because when the branch abides, then fruit is produced through them. That's all. That's, 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 that's just brilliant. Of all the things that people are going to tell you to do in the church and all the things that you ought to do as a Christian, I say, forget it all. Here's what you need to do. You simply need to stay attached to Jesus. And if you're attached to him, he will produce his life through you. And if you're detached from him, you are dead. I, I think when Jesus was walking along, when he got to the branch illustration that, that is broken off, I think he probably looked at a ground of some branch that had been cut off and it's dying and he goes, guys, that's never going to produce a thing because it's no longer connected to the vine. And all that thing has to do when it's connected is to just flow because a branch, trust me, a branch on a vine or anything else doesn't go, oh, okay, I'm going to get this out. Oh, I'm going to get this grape out, grape out if it's the last thing I do. The branch doesn't struggle. It doesn't work at producing the fruit. It is a conduit of fruit for the fruit, the nourishments that comes from the vine. Find your essence, find your nourishment in Jesus, and he will do his work through you. And all the flesh and all the work and all the energy combined will not produce anything if you're detached from him, broken off from him, in disobedience to him, living your own life, trying to pretend to be with him when in fact you're not. You will produce nothing. 
So what's the fruit that he wants to produce through us? I'm going to give you a couple in closing. Go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You know it well, but I don't know if you know it in the context of this. Galatians 5, 22. Jesus says, you remain, abide in him. He will produce a fruit through you. So what is the fruit that he wants to produce through you? Here's the fruit. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. And all you know by now that fruit isn't fruits of the Spirit, it's fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience is all one fruit that when we are attached to Him, His Spirit produces through us. Let me give you a second fruit. Go to Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go to Colossians 1.10. A second fruit that you will bear if you stay attached to him. Colossians 1.10 says this, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who is qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints and the light. Verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work. That work is a fruit. And if you're attached to him, it's a good fruit. There's a third fruit. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. <coughs> Hebrews 12, 11. I want you to underline this one, too. Or write it down and you can get to it later. Hebrews 12, 11 says this. You can find James, hopefully, that's all wrinkled. That, then Hebrews is before that. Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. That's the pruning. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You want to become righteous? Then you stay connected to Jesus because you will start living right because he will produce the fruit of righteousness in and through you. There's a fourth fruit for those of you who want to go even deeper, and it's found in John 15, 16. John 15, 16 says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. The fourth fruit is the fruit of reaching lost people. You want to reach the lost? The secret of reaching the lost is not to learn the gospel plan of salvation, though that is good. The secret of reaching the lost is not taking a seminar on evangelism, that's good. The secret of reaching the lost is to be connected to Jesus and his life and his love and his joy will produce in those people around you a longing, a taste that you have that they don't have, and evangelism will happen out of your fruitfulness. So what's this? You and I, this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, have one responsibility, to be connected to Jesus. That's it. How do I stay connected to Jesus? The scriptures. How do I stay connected to Jesus? obedience. How do I stay connected to Jesus? Prayer. 
but your responsibility and my responsibility is first and foremost to be a father, a husband, a mother, a grandparent, an employee who is first linked, abiding in, connected to Jesus and who will live their life this very day because of the pruning that has gone on in our lives to produce fruit that we never imagined we could produce in our lives. One thing. That's all you have to remember this week. One thing. Jesus said it 11 times. Abide in me. In the book, In Search of Excellence, Tom Peters evaluates companies that were excellent, and he found out that when he took the top 100 companies, they had one principle that drove them. They all focused on the basics. Here's the basic. Abide in Jesus. The excellent, excellent companies in a complex world were about one thing, simple over the complex. So when you get confused in your faith journey and try to figure out what you should do and how you should go and, and whether this guy told you you got to do this and dress that way and say these things and not say these things, abide. Be connected to, be a branch that simply rests. And you say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to attach myself to you and if I have any capacity to love, any capacity for peace, any capacity for joy, any capacity for anything, it will come as a result of the Holy Spirit indwelling all of my life, not just the living room. I want people to see you. I'm tired, Jesus. I'm tired of doing. I just want to be a conduit. I just want to be a nozzle. For a season, I just want to be a nozzle, and I want to see fruitfulness come, not because I made it happen, because, but because you made it happen through me. That's the teaching this morning. One thing. We're going to take communion, and you'll come forward uh, take the elements back to your chair and then we'll partake of them together.